I'm your host, Anna Acton. So today on Disability Wrap, we're going to be talking with Doug Green. Doug has worked as a photojournalist, author, and web developer with the di- editorial work in The New Yorker, Backpacker Mag- Magazine, and Photo District News, among others. He is an avid motorcyclist, and he is trying to raise awareness for, for glaucoma. So I'd like to start today by just welcoming you to the show, Doug. Thank you for coming to the studio to Nevada City today. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And you live right down the hill in Auburn. Right down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> I just slide right into it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Nevada City is one of your, your favorite towns, I'm sure. It is. It's. Um, I really like Nevada City a lot. It's. Um, it's got a nice combination of community and architecture and arts and all of that stuff. All those wonderful reasons that we we live here. Indeed. Yes, <laughs> or close by at least. Well, well, thank you for coming on the show today. Um, it's a pleasure to to get to meet you and, and have a chance to talk with you a little bit before the show. Um, we are going to have a lot, I think, to go over today in an hour. Um, and I really would like to just start by um, letting the listeners know a little bit about yourself. Um, who are you? Who's Doug Green? Um. Yeah, maybe I can give a quick snapshot of the part that is especially relevant to what we're talking about today. I've always been a um, content person, and I've been a very visual person. I graduated from Sac City and then San Jose State in journalism and photojournalism, and I've worked as a writer, photographer, editor, photo editor, information architect, web developer, um, content developer for online stuff and now I do videography mostly um, Mm. marketing videos but a very visual world I think visually I take in the world visually and you know I'm just I'm a visual person Mm -hmm. and it was um, eight years ago that I started noticing like things just weren't there in my vision it was weird. There was no pain. There was nothing like alarming that, you know, just jumped and said, go get checked. So I went into an ophthalmologist up in, uh, I remember it was in uh, Reno when I was staying with, visiting a friend up there. And the test came back, you know, that visual field test. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and said, you need to get your eyes checked fast by a specialist. So I was living in Marin County at the time, and I went to see a specialist there. And I'll never forget the moment. Um, they start that test, and you're looking in what looks like a white salad bowl turned on its side, and you're looking straight ahead at a dot. And then there's little flashes of light that they point all over the thing, almost like being in a planetarium maybe. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to hit a little mouse button every time you see the the light flash. And so the woman turns on the machine, leaves, and I'm supposed to be clicking the button, except I'm not seeing any little lights. And so I said, um, you know, you could turn the light. You, you want to turn this thing on? And she said, it is on. Oh, no. And there's just that little faint thing like, no, nah, I don't think she did. So she came back and she looked at it and she see it's on and she starts pointing to flashes and then finally starts seeing a couple bright ones. So I said, well, maybe you could start it over. So she does. And the same thing was happening. I wasn't seeing hardly any flashes. Um, Finally, I said, you know, maybe it's the drops you put in my eye. Maybe can we do this tomorrow? And she says, okay. So I came back the next day. Same experience, wasn't seeing much. Um, she checked both eyes, and she was, like, quiet when she left. I mean, she obviously knew something I didn't know. And she said, the doctor will see you, you know, momentarily. So I go in to see the doc, and he lays these charts out in front of me, and I could just see by the look in his face that something was really not good here. And he said, when was the last time you had your vision checked? And I said, it was probably seven, eight years ago. And he said, well, let me explain these charts. And he turns them over. And basically, they're like two circles, and they're either – they're filled in with black. And he said, if if you had perfect vision, there would be no black in here. And I looked at the left eye, and half of the circle was black and parts of the rest of it. And in the right eye, there was just a little hole left in the center. And he said, 
where it's lighter in here is where you can still see. Basically, what it meant was I'd lost 90% of the vision in my right eye and half in my left. Mm. And he said, that vision is gone forever. There's nothing you can do to get that back. This is beyond anything I can help you with. You need to go see an expert. And um, he said, there's nobody in, in Marin County that can help you. You're either going to have to go to San Francisco or Sonoma. And I looked at him and said, Sonoma? <laughs> I said, yeah. There's What's a, in Sonoma? There was a doctor. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I didn't want to deal with San Francisco. It was just mm-hmm. too big, too just, you know, I've never liked big cities. And um, there was a doctor there named Sonia Schluter who had just recently moved back from New Mexico where she was working. Um, she's an incredible doctor. I have i can't say enough good things about her. Anyway, thanks to her, and uh, I still have some vision left. But when she, when she saw the vision, you want to have your pressures under 20 in your eye. And it's, you know, think of it like the, your tire pressure. They use a different unit, but anything over 20 is not good. Mine had been at 50 for years and years. What happens in glaucoma is your eyeball inflates almost like a water balloon. And where the optical nerve exits the eye, if there's too much pressure, it gets crimped. And it's like, crimp, you know, taking wires and crimping them. They start to to break. In the case of your optical nerve, the cells, the neuron cells start to gangulate. It's called they die off. And it's like taking out your vision one pixel at a time on a monitor. And it starts on the outside, works its way in. So most people don't even notice it until it's too late. And that's that's why glaucoma is called the silent stealer of light. The silent stealer of light. Yeah. And so you had had your eyes checked out seven to eight years prior to this Ooh. experience. So this whole process of you losing 90 percent of your your sight in one eye and 50 or so percent in the other eye took place over a seven or eight year period. Yeah. Do you believe? Yeah. Maybe even less than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you didn't even you were not consciously aware. Of- no, there's no pain. There's no. It's not like it's there's a big contrast between, you know, day seven and day eight. It's just one cell at a time, like one grain of sand at a time being added to something. You just don't notice it. Because it happens so gradually. Yeah, and there's no physical sensations mm-hmm. to right. warn you mm-hmm. of something, like losing feeling somewhere or something. So, so then here you are in Sonoma at the specialist uh, f- for your eyesight, and she... Says what? So she says, um, oh, man. So she says, I don't think we can save your right eye. Mm -hmm. The left eye we might be able to. And, you know, she, (laughs) those were hard words to hear. I bet. Um, And I really, I mean, you know, we'll talk about depression here. I went down the. I went down the rabbit hole there, you know, to varying degrees. I was like kind of down the hole once, up a little bit, down again, deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, She, to her credit, was, uh, well, A, she's an incredible doctor. Her mom had been a glaucoma specialist, too, so she was a second-generation glaucoma expert. Um, she said, we're going to do the drops and, you know, she explained what glaucoma is, how it works, kind of the strategies. She also said, there are other things you can do beyond this, including, Mm -hmm. um, better diet, uh, cardio exercise, believe it or not, where you get your blood pumping. It actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you push, if you do intense exercise and get your blood pumping, it gets into those micro arteries serving the uh, eye. So I've always been an endurance cardio person anyway, but I definitely upped it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start running? <laughs> In fact, right near where I live, there's a hill called Cardiac Hill. It goes down into the American River Canyon. You visited that hill a lot? No. I still do. <laughs> I do it twice a, twice a week. Nice. So there's so she explained, you know, so talk a little bit about the treatment for glau- glaucoma. Glaucoma. So I have what's a normal typical glaucoma which is caused by pressure and the game the name of the game is to reduce the pressure and you basically have three lines of defense for doing that the first is eye drops and if i had started doing eye drops seven or eight years ago 
or seven, eight years be- prior to the diagnosis, I would have been fine, could have been managed, and I have probably, you know, 99% chance I could have kept normal vision throughout my life. Um, but because we lost so much, my right eye, especially just hanging by a thread, we had to go to a pretty aggressive stance. So the first line of defense is eye drops. I do three different eye drops three times a day. Um, that worked for about three years, and then my right eye started to, the pressure started going back up. And meanwhile, like sometimes I'm switching through different medications because I had an allergic reaction to one. They lose their efficacy after a while. Um, the next line of defense is blasting your eye with a laser. They actually kind of hit the mesh area in the eye. Um, I don't know that they even know why it works, but it hmm. seems to reduce pressure a little bit, just one, two, or three points. And that actually worked for about a year. And then they started going up again. So the third line of defense, um, so first you have the eye drops, then you have the laser treatment. The third one is to do what they call a trabeculectomy. And what they do is basically put a hole in your eye from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye. If you can imagine almost like a pressure cooker top, it's a way that when your eye gets too much pressure in it, it can leak out. It can release the pressure. And so I had that done. And at the same time, she also put a new lens in my eye because that can help. So that's cataract surgery. So I had cataract and trabeculectomy surgery at the same time. And um, that's worked. I still use drops in that eye, but I only have to use uh, one drop twice a day in that eye. And the pressures have stayed around 15, 16, even as low as 14, which is nice. Um, so that's it. You know, you've got the eye drops, and then you've got the laser, and then you've got the trabeculectomy. At some point, I'll have to have that done on my left eye, too. So, and, and this is something that's genetic, it is. Right. It's so. not in all cases, mm-hmm. but much of the time it is. And as it turns out, it is in our family. Unfortunately, I don't even know what glaucoma was. Mm-hmm. If it had been something that it, I'd been mindful of, you know, had on my radar screen, I would have been testing for it. And, and the importance of getting your eyes checked on an annual basis, right? Yeah. Could yeah, have, because it sounds like once the damage is done, it's done. It's done. All they can really do with treatment is to um, keep it from uh, getting worse. Right. That's the only game you have. Right. So um, we're talking with Doug Green and his experience with glaucoma. Um, Doug, when you heard the news and you realized that you had lost majority of your eyesight, what was, I mean, there's, there's the treatment, there's the, you know, trying to pursue that, but you know what, I mean, there's this whole internal discussion <laughs> that goes on and, and, and the grief that comes along with loss. Can you talk, yeah. are you willing to talk about that? Yeah, let's, let's dive in. I mean, it's, it's something I actually talk about now too. I speak for Placer County mm-hmm. about depression and suicide and trauma, um, and my books about it and all of that. So there's the five stages of grief. What is something, something, five stages of grief? Yeah. Um, you know, there's denial, anger. I'm going to forget the order here, but, uh, you know, kind of like let's make a deal. And then you go into depression. And then finally at the end of that is acceptance. But I went through the first three or four pretty fast, and I just went straight into depression. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, this is a whole other topic. There's the thing itself, and then there's a response to it. And my response to it was depression. But it's typical. I mean, this happens for, you know, I had a spinal cord injury. I went through a similar experience. People experience grief and loss in so many different ways in their lives. Yeah. So, you know, your experience, while it was unique to you, is also something that I think a lot of listeners at one time or another have probably gone through or will go through, unfortunately, whether it's a loss of a loved one or a personal loss due to disability. Um, yeah, it's it's a universal theme out there for sure. Yeah. How we get there is, you know, we have our own journey to it, but we all seem to, you know, I, I like to call it going down the rabbit hole. Um, yeah. But it's a hole. The thing I can say about depression is, I heard a a speaker say this once, suicide is a real place. It is a place where it is dark. There's a reason they call it a hole. Um, When I fell down, I lost sight of that kind of place where I fell in, you know, that hole of light up above. 
And I kept sliding down deeper and deeper, and my world got tighter and smaller and darker. I was fortunate that I had some friends in Marin that reached out, and one friend even put together what she called a suicide posse for me. I mean, I'm a, I got to the point where I really wanted to check out. It took me two years to get there. Um, so two years post-diagnosis. Yeah, I I kept sliding deeper and deeper, and I... You know, in that time, I lost my home, I lost my investments, because I just didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. And it got darker and darker, and um, oh, it was just, I had an experience where I felt, this was the turning point. It's almost like there's two energies in us. There's the life energy and the death energy. Life is a pretty high vibration. I mean, if we simplify it, in my experience, it's life is like this high, bright vibration, and death is this lower, deep, dark vibration. And I was kind of caught in between them. And I was still trying to, you know, life energy is pretty strong. But I had an experience where I felt the hand of death reach out to me. I mean, it was a real visceral experience of the hand of death reaching out to me. And I reached back for it. And I felt the deepest peace I'd ever known. And in that moment, I decided I want to die. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put up with this pain, this internal pain anymore. And at that point, I made my plans. I, I knew how I was going to go. I knew where I was going to go. The question was when. And when was really dependent upon getting my stuff, my, you know, my exit strategy in order, like getting my will done and getting rid of my stuff and sort of cataloging all my photos and getting them digitized and leaving instructions for people on the, you know, once I exited. And um, I was, I was so comfortable with this. So that dark energy had really pulled me in and it was peaceful. And I got to say, I no longer fear death. In fact, I mm -hmm. maybe have too much of a comfort level with it. Um, but Life had other plans. <laughs> <laughs> that's a powerful story. I mean, that's a powerful place to be, you know, in your life. Um, what What was the turning point? I mean, at what point was there a glimmer of light? The life vibration, at what point were you able to, to it, well, connect with know, that again? I wouldn't even call it life vibration. It was something, um, no, I guess maybe it was. I, that's a good question. What it was, was... Um, a voice that came from both within me and outside of me, something bigger than me. Mm. I'm not religious. So I'm not going to say God, but higher self, higher place, um, you know, great spirit, whatever. A voice came through, and it said, do your bucket list. Do your bucket list. And I looked up. I mean, literally, I looked up in the air and I'm like, what? <laughs> bucket list. <laughs> and one of the things I've noticed, and I've also talked with others about this, is even when you're in that darkest of places and seeming insanity of suicide, there's still logic going on. Mm. And I, I mean, this bucket list thing like was big. And the logic was, if I check out, I can't do my bucket list. Oh, right. But if I do my bucket list, I can still check out. Mm. It was literally that simple. And But I had another problem. The first item on that bucket list, I've always been a whitewater kayaker. Not always, but I had been for 30 years, and it was a big part of my life. And the first bucket list item was to kayak down the Grand Canyon. Now, <laughs> in North America, there's, you know, there's, there's great trips and there are great trips. Right. And the Grand Canyon, white, doing a rafting trip, kayaking trip down the Grand Canyon is considered one of the greatest. It's like the Holy Grail. It's certainly <laughs> one of them. Right. And the friends of mine that had done it described moving into something called river time. They, when you're on the, it's a three week trip on a private trip when mm -hmm. we did it. And, they talk about moving out of sort of our, you know, human constructed time things, time constraints of, you know, work and play, you know, our sort of regimented world and moving into a more natural way of being. 
na- natural time because you're outdoors, you're dependent upon when the sun rises, when the sun sets, you're on the river, you've got kind of set things you're doing. And so I knew I, I had to do that trip. The problem was it was a 15-year wait <laughs> right. to do a private trip. And I was <laughs> so, like, we have a problem here. <laughs> so, okay, so bucket list, just real quick. You, it, you know, in the depths of grief and sorrow and, and with a plan for suicide, yeah. you have this idea that you need to do your bucket list. And if you do your bucket, you know, if you're if you die, you can't do your bucket list. So let's at least try to do the bucket list before. Yeah. And so th- how many items were on your bucket list? So you, the first one so going down th- the Grand Canyon. Yeah, there were three items on yeah. the first one. And they really, they popped right out right then and there. First one was to kayak down the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Second one was to ride what's called the Continental Divide Ride, which is a, um, it's a motorcycle trip from Mexico to Canada or Canada to Mexico, which depending on which direction you go. But um, on dirt roads, remote dirt roads, all along the Continental Divide. And um, it's about, I think it's 2,700 miles of dirt. And I wanted to do it solo. And I wanted, well, so that was that. And then the third one was to ride a motorcycle on what's called the Pan American Highway, which is from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. Wow. Okay, friends so have done you're, all these. you go big. Yeah, go big or go home. <laughs> right. Go, yeah, yeah. Bu- go big or check out. <laughs> right. So the first on the bucket list is uh, going down the Grand Canyon, kayaking the Grand Canyon. Yeah. But you have a 15-year wait. Yeah. At that time, it was a 15-year wait to get a permit. So that's when about a week after that bucket list thing knocks me over the head, um, a friend from Nevada City, actually, um, Tom Meinholtz, calls me up and says, Doug, he's a kayaking buddy of mine. Tom says, hey, Doug, you know that Grand Canyon permit I put in for 15 years ago? And I'm on the phone like, this can't be happening. Oh, my gosh. I just got it. We're putting in on in putting on in two months. Do you want to go? And I... And I'm, I'm kind of choking up when I remember this. I was like, oh, my God, there's something bigger than me happening here. And, of course, I'm like, yes, I want to <laughs> go. Put me on that trip. I was the first person he, person he asked and obviously the first person that said, yeah. yeah. And he brought together an incredible group of people. I mean, a Grand Canyon trip can really go bad if you got the wrong people because you're a group that has to work together. you pack grass together, you break them down, you set up camp, you cook together. You've got to work as a team. And part of the credit I want to give to Tom is he had the dream team. We had doctors, nurses, I think we had a professional cook. Um, Everybody on that trip was just, you know, a 10-star person in their own way. And we we all had our differences, but we worked so well together. And we had three commercial people that had been commercial guides on there, so they knew that you know that kind of routines and where to camp. And I mean, it was just, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, there's that saying: wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. And changing location doesn't change what's going on internally. And even on this dream trip, I remember about day two. I started going down the rabbit hole again. There were hikes I couldn't do, scrambles I couldn't do, especially because I just couldn't see and it was too dangerous. And I started going back into that dark place. Mm. And even though I tried to control that, um, in a situation like that, it's going to leak out. You're just too close and too intertwined with everybody else. And the leader of our group, a guy named John and Jimmy, God, I'll never forget this. Morning of day four, I learned I had to get up early because it took me longer to pack and get everything done just because it, you know, I couldn't see everything and I had to really set up my systems to make sure I didn't forget anything. But I was packed early and John came up to me and he said, Doug, I have a sense of what you're going through. And this is a guy that he knows a river and he said, three miles down on river left is a place called Redwall Cavern. It's a sacred place. Go there, do whatever it is you need to do. 
And as he said that, I was like, oh my God, I've got this, I have a destiny with this place. I have no idea what's going to happen there, but I have to go there. So I got on my boat, went down, couldn't miss it. It's a cavern as, as big as a whole block here in Nevada City, mm-hmm. just carved out from the cliff. Unbelievable place. Sacred. I pulled my boat up on shore. I took off my gear, and I just fell to my knees. And I surrendered. And that was the beginning of the turning point. Um, the experience, I, I think of it like vectors, life vectors. All my vectors were headed to a point. Life vectors. And I equated what that crossing as being death literal death like that's where I was going to die and that's you know so in that cavern those lines indeed showed up and I finally made it to that point and I remember I mean I was screaming and raging and yelling and wave after wave of stuff coming up slamming my fists into that the cliffs there until they bled just releasing grief and anger and sadness and all this stuff that had just built up and I remember finally I just yelled I just want to die why can't I just die and then just like that it cleared And on the other side of that point was this spaciousness I'd never known. It's like if you carry a heavy load up, like a backpack up some really, really steep trail that just is unrelenting, and then you get to the top and you take it off. That (laughs) feeling of lightness. Lightness, yeah. That was the sensation, except it was even bigger. It was an internal spaciousness and lightness. And all of a sudden, that world that had been so constricted and tight and with no room for anything other than that crazy voice inside, you know, mind-made mental madness, um, there was room for grief and sadness and anger, but also for hope Mm -hmm. and maybe joy, you know, like getting on with life. And that was the turning point. Wow, that's a powerful story. Thank you for for being willing to share that. Um, We're talking with um, Doug Green about his experiences with grief and suicide and uh, thoughts and and glaucoma. Um, That's powerful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So you made it through... The river. And it was just, and it's interesting because you hear people that have gone through just the experience of going down the Colorado River, of it being a life-changing um, trip for, for many people. And and it, it was so profound for you. Yeah, it's, um, there were other experiences too. I mean, it was, there, you know, it was this place called Matt Catneba Cavern. It was like the throne room of the gods. It's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And there was sort of, I'm sure in my altered state, too, it like hit me even deeper. And then also, um, the big rapid is lava. lava. And I had a perfect run on it. Hmm. Um, I remember when I got to the bottom of that rapid, Tom came up. And he said, you did it, Doug. Your dream of running this river top to bottom, like no, no portaging, top to bottom. It's going to happen. That was huge. That was huge. So I come off the river. Um, yeah, it's like, oh my God, if the f- so, the bucket list, right? So if the first, <laughs> if the first trip could be so powerful without even having a an intention of bringing any kind of life altering thing to it, I mean, right. the goal was to just get down the the river, right? And have Check the, it off your bucket list. Yeah, right? more or less. Just that simple. <laughs> Like, what would be the possibilities of actually bringing an intention to the second trip? Okay. And so the second trip was to ride a motorcycle solo from Mexico to Canada up the Continental Divide. I just have to stop you for a minute. Sure. You are blind. (laughs) 
that's the first thing I thought is that, you know, you have significant vision loss, you know, how, so just to clarify that, because you do have significant vision loss, but you still have some vision left. Yeah. So my world is like, um, I wish I could show you the, the picture of how I see the world, but the, um, imagine holding a toilet or a paper towel tube up to your right eye and looking through that. That's what my vision in my right eye is like. And in my left eye, um, it's a bit better. It's half my vision's gone, maybe 55%. But if you took a sheet of paper and you were looking straight ahead at the horizon line and you dropped the sheet of paper right to the horizon line from the top, that's what I basically have left. I have no vision above the horizon line. Pretty good vision left to right across the midsection, and then it's a little bit's gone down below. Mm. So that's what my vision's like. And the only guarantee is that it won't get better. Mm. And it can very easily get worse. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm left with. But I do have enough vision left to drive. Fortunately, because of that swath on my left eye that goes left to right, I've got right. that peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. But I have to be careful. Yeah. You know, I don't drive into big cities. Um, Is night driving more difficult? or Actually, in some ways it's easier because uh -huh. the hard part, I don't have the ability. Our peripheral vision does such an incredible job of kind of filtering out automatically the stuff that we don't need to pay attention to, but lets in the stuff that we do need to pay attention to. And I don't have that ability to filter stuff out so easily. So I have to scan constantly. So at night, all that visual noise drops down. Mm. And then usually things you have to be aware of are moving <laughs> or have right. a light on them. <laughs> right, so. hopefully. So, okay, so, so the next, number two on your bucket list. Yeah, is the Continental Divide ride. And um, some friends of mine had done it. Well, actually, Tom, same guy that invited me on the Grand Canyon, just on that ride. Just sounded like an incredible journey. So I wanted to do it alone, and I wanted to do something to turn it into a growthful trip. And I searched around. I was living in Marin at the time, asked a few friends, and one said, well, why don't you do chakras? You know, it makes sense. You're going up the spine of the country. You want to be gone two months. There's seven chakras. You could do a chakra per week. And it's like, yeah, let's do chakras. Mm -hmm. So I got a few books, uh, one by Anadea Judith uh, called The Eastern Eastern uh, Eastern Body, Western Mind. And um, turns out she was the partner of, a fr of one of the guys in my men's club. <laughs> I didn't realize that at the time. Anyway, I did the chakras along the way, and there's survival, um, sort of pleasure, power, love, um, voice, vision, and then sort of chakra seven, which is that sort of ethereal and third eye thing. And I did, I just, I hit the road with the books, would kind of do these exercises, and then I'd open myself to the road and say, okay, well, bring me the experiences that I need to grow in this chakra. As I'm riding through these remote areas and going into these small towns and out in the middle of nowhere, and once again, the power of surrender, the experiences I had along the way were unbelievable. In chakra one, I ended up spending a week on a, the ranch of a friend uh, in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Um, all about earth survival right or no that was chakra yeah that was the first chakra um second week pleasure i ended up at valley view hot springs in colorado mm -hmm. and i met a woman who was just coming from a workshop in santa fe on chakras <laughs> and we ended up becoming involved um chakra three power i mean you know each chakra mm -hmm. along the way had this its own power. Oh God, it was incredible. And when when was this? At what point in your journey with with you know your so, eyesight and loss of eyesight? Did... It was about four months after the Grand Canyon trip. Okay. I jumped right into into the second bucket list item. Mm -hmm. I was I wasn't doing anything else. I still had some resources that I could drop mm -hmm. into to do that, and it was obviously the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So. So two months later, or how long three, did it take? Three, four months, and it took two months uh -huh. to do the trip, uh -huh. um, yeah. the way I was doing it. And, yeah. 
And so, and then you had your third item. Yeah, the third one's a bigger item. Um, what, five, six years have passed since I did, did the second bucket list item. Mm-hmm. The third one is to ride a motorcycle from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. Basically, as far north as you can go to as far south as you can go on roads on of land. any kind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In the <laughs> North and South America. And I want to bring something to that, too. Right, some sort of growth, some sort of the 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 common theme is there's an outer adventure that provides the narrative for an internal journey, and this third one is going to be about giving back, and I want to raise awareness about vision issues, possibly depression, trauma, and right now I've been speaking a lot to Lions Clubs, which are about vision. Mm-hmm. You know, they're Helen Keller challenged them back in, I think, the 1920s to, like, be the knights to go out there and help people with vision problems. And they're all over the world, and they're doing an incredible job about raising awareness and getting glasses to kids in areas where they can't get glasses. And a lot of what they do is about vision. So I find them to be a really good group to align with. So... What has been your experience with the grief process um, since, um, you know, since this? I know, you know, it's not easy, you know, just you saw the light, so to speak. You came out of that deep depression and grief and were able to to get through that. But it's a life. Yeah, it's never ending. Right. It's you have to be diligent. I have gone down the rabbit hole a few times since then. And um, you've got to. You kind of be on top of it. Um, there were a few things that came out of that. So one was a couple of books that I found especially powerful. And one was called um, "In an Unspoken Voice" by Peter Levine. The how the body wants to heal. We don't heal in our heads. Talk therapy and all that stuff will only get you so far. Real healing. It's like you know you see an animal get it. Like a deer gets attacked by a. I don't know, a a lion, and it survives, or a cougar, and it survives. It shakes itself. You know, an animal will shake that kind of trauma out of itself, and then it just gets up and moves on with its life. We kind of have to do that same thing. If that energy gets stuffed in us, we hold it down, it will manifest itself in other ways. And um, so that's, you know, A, we heal in our body more than in our head. Two, an incredible book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. He was a psychologist in Austria, or psychiatrist, get the two mixed up, um, that was studying trauma and in pre-Nazi Austria. Um, well, not pre-Nazi, pre-World War II. The Nazis mm-hmm. came in, he was captured, he survived the death camps. He lived in the death camps for three or four years survived and watched others both die and survive and he studied both firsthand and through his observations what what is it that people that survive have and those that don't don't and it was purpose they had something bigger than themselves to drive them whether it was a piece of work they had to create or a family they wanted to reconnect with something bigger than themselves that enabled them to mm-hmm rise above and transcend their circumstances. So for me, this trip and the work I do, the book I wrote, is all about finding purpose in this. And we don't nece- I don't believe that purpose necessarily just comes to us out of the blue. It's something that maybe we just have to create. Mm-hmm. And for people in dark places, sometimes it's just a matter of like getting through the day, the stuff that's coming at you. Rise above it. Deal with it. Keep moving forward because you got to believe there's something better on the other if you can keep going. If you don't have that, um, you know, why live? And what was the purpose for you? Was it the bucket list or was it something larger than that? No, I would say the bucket list led me to it. It's to communicate this. I mean, I really... They say when you're in a depre- de- the quickest way to get out of a depression is to go out and help others. <laughs> right. And I, it's really true. Right. And I, I really like speaking, getting this message out. It gives me, 
I don't know, it just fulfills me in ways to help others and raise awareness and get the conversation going. There's so much stigma around depression and suicide and darkness. And to get that, just get the conversation going so that people are more able to go out and help friends and family um, get through this, let them know they're not alone. Um, is huge. It's huge. I mean, that's why we do disability rap. That's why, you know, my life purpose with working with people with disabilities, um, I think has also helped me get to a similar kind of point with my own disability um, through that purpose and finding meaning in life. And I think that um, it's so true. There is so much stigma about these topics. How often do people talk about grief? How often do people talk about suicide? You know, um, and, and I, I found it just the irony of, of your bucket list. And I know that's just a piece. It was a tool for you to get where you're at. But it there's, I don't know if you call it irony in it or what have you, but there is so much stigma. And there's so often that people with vision loss, blind, complete blindness, physical disability, mental health disability, I don't care what it is, are told, oh, you will never be able to do, you know, whatever it is, fill in the blank again. And so the idea that you coming from, you know, very well being around people would be like, oh, you poor thing, you're never going to be able to drive or do those wonderful things that you used to want do or, or, you know, be that adventurous spirit that you were anymore because of it. I mean, that's what people are told subtly and not so subtly uh, when they acquire a disability or, you know, live with a disability. So the idea of a bucket list is just kind of genius, right? Because I'm like, <laughs> yes, you can still have your bucket list. Right. Regardless of who you are, or what age you are, or what disability you have. Right. It may look different. It may feel a little different than you once imagined, you know, whatever you have on your bucket list. But you can still have that bucket list. I don't care, you know, what your limitations are. Sort of an aside, but very related. Um, about 15 years ago, I was trekking in Nepal and I went up to Everest Base Camp. And I happened to meet a guy named Pasquale who was an expedition leader on Everest. And the year before, he had led what was arguably the most successful Everest expedition ever. He'd gotten the first, he got the most people on the summit in one day, the oldest mm -hmm. person, the first father and son team. But he's also the one that got the blind person to the oh, summit. Yes. And I had dinner with him that oh. night. What I loved about Pascal, I mean, he's, he's brash, he's almost like a swashbuckling buccaneer. But he also totally gave credit. He said, we did not halt. This guy's name is Eric um, that m made it to the summit. We didn't haul him up that mountain. He earned his right to be on our team. Mm -hmm. And I've since been in communication with Eric via email. He is an extraordinary person. He's totally blind. He summited Everest, which I can't even fathom. And he's also kayaked down the Grand Canyon blind. Mm. I mean, between the two, climbing Everest and, you know, going down the Grand Canyon kayaking <laughs> blind, I would say the Grand Canyon's the harder deal. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, to be in a, it's, it's hard enough to fathom things when you're, you know. Do you have to, a, a guide, a sighted guide? Did he, he have did a have guide? one, but, yeah. you know, yeah. best he can do is over years. When you're yeah. in a kayak, you're right. getting pushed over and knocked down and yeah. it's, the water is swirling and I can't even imagine what that would be like. But so that's, there's the cutting edge of what's possible. Two minutes left? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you we needed a few hours with you on the show because I really appreciate um, your you want, message. We can come back and do part two we can't, sometime. We will. We will. How about that? That's a promise. Um, so, so with just a couple more minutes in the show, you know, we've, We've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about, you know, those things that are taboo topics from grief and depression and suicide and, and then, you know, living life with a disability. So, you know, you've written amazing books. How do people oh. learn more about you? And what do you want people to go away from the show with? <laughs> so a few things. One, um, get the book. It's called From <laughs> Grief to Grace. And you can go to fromgrieftograce.com. But two is this whole thing about stigma. Be there for friends. Be willing to have that conversation. It may bring up discomfort in you. Go there anyway. You'll grow. Don't 
bring your agenda to the person that you're trying to help. Just be there. Just listen. Be a voice. Be someone they can trust because they're not going to hear you. Trying to fix them just makes it worse. Right. Just be there and reach out. Be that friend. Uh, that's so true. Don't be afraid to have that conversation with people. Yeah. And say the unspoken. Feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. So how can people learn more about you or get in contact with you if they'd like to? So um, go to DougGreenAuthor.com. Mm -hmm. I think I still have to kind of pull that website together. But uh, Doug Green, there's an E on the end of green, DougGreenAuthor.com. And that'll take you, you can see more about wh where I speak, about the book, um, some of the projects I'm working on. And then also, if I actually do video as with a media company, marketing videos, and that's DougGreenMedia.com. Again, an E on the end of green. Um, and especially if you've got a Lions Club or someplace where it would be appropriate for me to speak, um, I can certainly do that. Excellent. And the book is Grief to Grace. From Grief to Grace. From Grief to Grace yes. by Doug Green. And check out FromGriefToGrace.com. It's available on Amazon. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Yeah, thank you. Really was a pleasure having you um, on the show. And thank you for talking about these things that I know many listeners, you know, have um, experience with in one way or another, whether personally or through a family member or friend. Um, so, so thank you for speaking the unspoken. Yeah, thanks. And I got to say, I love this town. <laughs> <laughs> I love it here. Any excuse to come back up here is great. We'll, we'll have good. you come back and, and do a, a you know second phase of the show with Doug Green. So again, that was Doug Green here on Disability Rap. Disability Rap happens the first Friday of every month here on KVMR FM Nevada City, KCPC Camino.